right, we'll get Ali and. If the panelists could come to the front, we'll be we'll be starting in a in a, a minute or two. If the panelists get the test. Yeah, you go here, we'll, we'll go in speaking order. Do 
we're recording from that one there. The presenter, and we also do awesome. the microphone. That's just for the speaker, though. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Australia and the world, both in person and online, to this public panel on the topic of imperialism. What is it and why should we be against it? Hosted by the Melbourne chapter of the Platypus Sibiliate Society. My name is Ryan Nickla and I'll be the moderator for this event. This is the seventh Platypus panel we've hosted in Melbourne on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and we thank the audience for being in attendance. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006 in Chicago, organises reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left of the 1920s and 1930s, the new left of the 1960s and 1970s, and the post-political left of the 1980s and 1990s, all for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. You can learn more about our activities on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter through at Platypus Melbourne, or by visiting our website, www.platypus1917.org. We also have a podcast titled Shit Platypus Says, which can be streamed on SoundCloud, and a monthly uh, international open access publication called The Platypus Review, and you can find free copies on the table at the back. Platypus also runs a reading group where we go through a yearly syllabus from Rousseau to Marx to Lenin to Adorno, trying to understand what Marxism was. This primary reading group starts again in late January. Two streams running will be uh, concurrent. One stream meets in person on Thursdays at the Kathleen Syme Library in Carlton, and the other on Wednesday nights on Zoom for Australia-wide participation. The panel topic for today is imperialism. What is it and why should we be against it? And the panelists have been asked to respond to the following prompt. On various fronts, such as Ukraine, Palestine, and China, the left is using the rallying cry of imperialism to oppose or support the actions of various state powers. Domestically, we see rising tensions over the bipartisan political support for the AUKUS Pact. Under the banner, and under the banner of an anti-imperialist politics, we see the left opposing both the saber rattling and the massive spending involved on the war machine while pointing to a crumbling, neglected welfare state. In light of these tensions, this panel seeks to cl clarify the character of the imperialism question on the left, from Marx's lifetime to the Second International and through to the contemporary anti-war movement. Platypus asks, what did Marxists mean by the term imperialism in World War I, which they called the imperialist war? How did the Marxist critique of imperialism differ from liberal critiques? How has, has the concept of imperialism or its significance been clarified in the centuries since Len Lenin's famous, famous pamphlet, and if so, how? Our format is simple. Each of the three panellists will have around 12 minutes for opening remarks, then five to seven minutes each after everyone has spoken to respond to fellow panellists. We'll then have a short five minute break, and then we'll resume with 90 minutes or so of audience Q&A if time permits, we'll also take some questions from the online audience. For the Q&A, I hope to call on only questions. If you have more of a comment, then I encourage you to work it into a short piece of writing and submit it to the Platypus Review, where the transcript for this event, along with uh, selected responses, will be published. And our speakers for today read out an agreed-upon speaking order. Neil Kay is a member of the Spartacist League of Australia, a section of the International Communist League, Fourth Internationalist. Anthony Puria is a communist youth involved in organising since age 13, promoting revolutionary politics and student radicalism. Currently, Anthony serves on the Central Committee of the Revolutionary Communist Organisation, RCO, and is the chair of the RCO's Collective of Leninist Youth, based in Melbourne. David Glanz has been a member of the International Socialist Tendency since 1977, first in Britain and since 1987 in Australia. He is a member of the Solidar Solidarity Editorial Committee and an activist with the Refugee Action Coalition and the No Orcus Coalition. He is a member of the NEAA, the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. The event will conclude in under three hours before 4 p.m., at which point you're invited to join us around the corner at Howler uh, to continue the discussions. With that, I hand it over to Neil, who will begin his opening remarks. Neil? Well, 
For Marxists, imperialism is the final stage of capitalism based on monopolies and the domination of parasitic finance capital. It is a thoroughly reactionary roadblock to the advancement of humanity, strengthening the development of productive forces and leading to war and terminal social decay. I think we can all agree we need to oppose imperialism. The central question is what strategy to defeat it. The world today is marked by the breakdown of US global hegemony and the disintegration of the liberal world order. US imperialism must lash out at perceived threats such as Russia and China while squeezing its allies like Australia to contribute more as it accelerates toward war. This is also the context for the slaughter in Gaza where the US and Israel are securing their interests in that region by violating the national rights of the Palestinians. The question posed is will the decline of the US result in a deepening spiral of reaction or will it further the interests of the working class and the cause of socialism? If the anti-imperialist struggle is left in the hands of non-revolutionary forces such as Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, Hamas or the labour-like union bureaucracy in Australia, this can only lead to new and greater crises. The only way to further the interests of the working class is by mobilising the international proletariat as an independent fighting force armed with a revolutionary leadership. This poses key tasks for revolutionaries here. The Australian rulers are fundamentally committed to the camp of US imperialism, sheltering under its military shield. In turn, the ALP and ACTU leaderships are firmly wedded to Australian imperialism. While many union leaders have opposed Australia's embrace of the declining US empire, they refuse to break unity with the open pro-imperialists in the labour movement. Why? Because at the bottom they share the same pro-capitalist program. As such, they are an obstacle to advancing the struggle of the working class. The task at hand is to build a revolutionary anti-imperialist pole against the current misleaders of the labour movement. There can be no talk of a Marxist strategy in the Ukraine war against AUKUS or in Palestine today without a ruthless struggle against the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement, as well as against the pacifist deceivers and those leftists who maintain unity with the social chauvinists. So, uh, David, Solidarity writes that they oppose the pro-imperialist ALP and ACTU leadership. So what is your group concretely doing to expose and break workers from the left union bureaucrats who maintain unity with these very same people. Anthony, the RCO correctly points out the treachery of the Labour Party and the defeats it has repeatedly delivered. Your propaganda sounds very radical, however it doesn't provide any answers for the working class in the here and now, just maximalist verbiage about revolution in the sweet by and by. What is your perspective to break the hold of Labourism on the working class, especially left plagiarism. This is the key obstacle to revolutionary struggle against imperialism in this country. Take the question of AUKUS, which ties Australia to US war plans against China. Real working class force will need to be brought to bear here and throughout the region to stop AUKUS. In this country, what is retarding that? Why has the movement against AUKUS shriveled to almost nothing today? A big part of the reason is that the leadership of the campaign has been in the hands of little Australian pacifists and left union bureaucrats whose whole framework was not to mobilise their base against AUKUS, but to manoeuvre with and lobby ALP politicians at their national conference. We know what a disaster that was. Along with the Bolshevik-Leninist group, we say there needs to be a campaign to drive the AUKUS hawks out of the ALP and union leadership. At the ALP conference, we put it to anti-AUKUS delegates that you can't fight against this military pact in league with those who support it. Through this campaign, we fought to expose the left labour rights and plant a revolutionary pole inside, against AUKUS 
inside the labor movement, providing a rallying point for real opponents of imperialism while driving a wedge between the ALP's working class base and its pro-imperialist leaders. We approached the other two groups on this panel to join this campaign to drive out the Yorkist lovers. They refused. What do they do instead? Solidarity has been busy building the No Walkers Coalition. This pushes the same pacifist politics and people which led the defeat at the ALP conference. As for the RCO, they spout many fine words about putting an end to imperialism while claiming the ALP is bourgeois and the unions affiliated to Labor are bought off. But your red and red propaganda does nothing to break workers from the pro-imperialist Labor leaders or their left lieutenants in the union bureaucracy. Workers will not spontaneously break from Labor because you denounce them as corporatist or bourgeois. The RCO provides no clear direction to overcome the labour right obstacles to proletarian revolution. We really do need an anti-war movement, a communist anti-war movement. To fight imperialism, they must begin with exposing the pro-imperialist traders and their left critics in the labour movement, who can sometimes talk socialist but kowtow to the pro-imperialists. This is what we have done through our campaign against the workers. But the positions of RCO and Solidarity only help stymie any independent revolutionary opposition to the left labourites, who cover for the pro-imperialist hawks in the ALP, who in turn are administering Australian imperialism and pushing hawkers forward. On the Ukraine war, the starting point is to understand that the war was provoked by US imperialism. On one side, Zelensky's regime is fighting to keep Ukraine under US and EU domination. And on the other, Russia is fighting to put Ukraine under its boot. In this war, we call on Ukrainian and Russian workers and soldiers to fraternize and turn the guns against their own rulers to transform what is a reactionary war between nations into a civil war against their ruling classes. In the West, our modest forces have fought for the workers' movement to take action against the imperialist governments, calling for union action to stop military shipments to Ukraine and to break imperialist sanctions on Russia. Australia's rulers help arm Ukraine and sanction Russia at the behest of their US big brother. Falling into line behind the Albanese government and NATO, the union leaders right through from the ACTU to the left union bureaucracy, have all been gung-ho in their support to Ukraine. There needs to be a determined struggle against the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement, as well as against its pacifist swindlers, with the aim of building an anti-imperialist and revolutionary leadership of the working class. Contrast this with Solidarity and the RCO's approach. Both groups claim the Ukraine war is an inter-imperialist uh, conflict between NATO and Russia, demanding revolutionary defeatism. Newsflash. The imperialists are in Washington and Canberra, not Moscow. Neither group puts forward a path of struggle for the workers of Russia and Ukraine, nor do they take up the fight against the union tops who support Australian imperialism's role in this bloody conflict. Uh, I'm sure David will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Solidarity has been silent on the MUA's outrageous campaign for stronger bans against uh, Russia. Now, the RCO uh, rightly slams the socialist chauvinists who support Ukraine under the guise of national liberation and the defence of democratic rights. They correctly say that these rallying cries are for the working class to subordinate its interest to the imperialism of their own state. Too true. So how do you break workers from these social chauvinists? You conclude a class line must be drawn against their politics. Um, fine. But with no concrete program of action, this is just sterile propaganda. Today, the US's minions, Israeli minions, are raising death and fire on Gaza. As Palestinians are being slaughtered, it's the same supporters of AUKUS within the ALP 
who have backed the Zionist onslaught. Some Labor MPs and union leaders uh, today peddling the same sort of impotent statements of outrage and appeals for peace over Palestine as was done over AUKUS, while maintaining unity with the same ALP militarists. <coughs> the same dead-end strategy pursued over AUKUS. An example of this is the Petition Solidarity Orchid, now signed by uh, thousands of unionists, which calls for peace, justice and solidarity with the Palestinians without a single criticism of the ALP leadership, let alone fighting to split with them. In contrast, we fight for immediate union bans against the shipment of military goods to Israel, for strikes against the Australian imperialist support to Israel and butchery. To realise this requires exposing the false friends of Palestine in the unions and ALP to cover for the pro-imperialist leaders. Those who want to fight for Palestinian liberation must wage a fight inside the workers' movement to build an anti-imperialist pole against the current leaders. Now, the, the RCO have produced three statements on, uh, pal on the Palestinian question, but none offer a perspective for what the working class should do, either in Australia or Israel or anywhere, to defend the besieged Palestinians. Instead of a working class road forward, uh, we, get, we get from solidarity, and what we get from solidarity in the RCO is a cover up of the masses reactionary strategy, which is all about provoking a reaction from Israel, and which by targeting civilians only compacts Israeli workers behind the Zionist state. Palestinian liberation requires the destruction of the Zionist state carved out of the Palestinian nation by the imperialists. Only a revolutionary solution, that is the alliance of the Jewish-Israeli working class with the Palestinian people against imperialism and the Zionist underlings can bring real peace. <coughs> the unravelling of the US world order promises increased reaction, crises and war. That is, unless Marxists are successfully able to provide revolutionary leadership <coughs> to the struggles against imperialism, one that provides a path away from the endless defeats of the past decades. This is what we in the ICL are struggling to do, and it is the opposite of what Solidarity and the RCO do. Thank you. Anthony, would you like? <coughs> I would like to preface this by saying that when I initially sat down to write this speech, Henry Kissinger, the imperialist butcher, was still alive. And it brings me, and I'm sure many others, immense satisfaction that, just days before this panel on imperialism, that murderous orchestrator of imperial ambition finally carved it. Although he may have done so, unfortunately surrounded by loved ones and family, at an immense age, he also died at a time when the US imperial hegemony he worked so tirelessly to upheld was finally unravelling at the seams, and all he could do was watch. <clears throat> With the advent of World War I and its bloody, dramatic unfolding from 1914 until 1918, the question of imperialism appeared on the stage of Marxist thought with a vitalised urgency and prominence. Named the Imperialist War by Marxists, driven forward by the forces of capitalist monopolization, the concentration of production in the industrial capitalist states of Europe, and their export of capital abroad, Lenin's quintessential pamphlet, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, represents a condensed culmination of the Marxist theory advanced and developed through the experience of the war. Yet we, as scientific socialists, would be remiss to dismiss or discard the progression of capitalist dominance over the globe since the Great War, and the development of capitalist relations and means of production into the 21st century, which necessitate, and have indeed given rise to, an expanded, clarified notion of imperialism today. With the expansion of capital's reach across the world came the theoretical development of theories of imperialism and imperialist exchange. Indeed, as capitalism developed, so too did imperialism as a world system 
as an absolutely quintessential part of modern capital, dominating all aspects of global capitalist exchange and relations. First raised to particular prominence in the 1960s and 70s in the debates on dependency theory and exchange, the Marxist understanding of imperialism was greatly clarified and developed through the period of rapid globalization in the late 20th and early 21st century. <coughs> this period saw the incredible expansion of capitalist relations to all parts of the world, the uprooting of swathes of remaining subsistence farmers, the creation of wage dependency in relations internationally, and the final cementing through acts of incredible economic and political violence of an international periphery, semi-periphery, and imperial core. Such a system is epitomized in the cementing of relations of production in which the proletarian layers of those in the periphery and semi-periphery are subjected to hyper-exploitation, the exploitation of mass amounts of surplus value and capital to the imperial core through transnational corporations who aid developing states in keeping the price of local labor power as low as possible, as exploitable as possible, in order to satiate the unending demand of capital for expansion and the self-valorization of value into oblivion. This represents not a split from the theory of imperialism set forth by Lenin, utilizing Marx's capital as its base, but rather its clarification and development. The domination of immense financial monopolies has suffused all aspects of global capitalism, and indeed has been instrumental in its construction and maintenance through the so-called neoliberal period of global capital from the late 20th to early 21st century. Capitalism as a world system has succeeded in cementing its split of the global relations of production into the periphery, the semi-periphery, and the imperial core nations. The proletariat of the semi-periphery, the great manufacturers of the world, face the brutal, naked exploitation of the value of their labor power to an extreme extent. Beyond that, faced by many workers in imperial countries themselves, regardless of pro productivity increases over the past 20 years, or the industrial bank monopolies chokehold on specialized labor, on advanced technologies and labor processes. The profits extracted from such exploitation of the semi-periphery and periphery, fully integrated into the 21st century capital as a world system, serves to affect the concessions and offset the concessions granted to the working class of imperial countries themselves. This process of development at the expense of the workers of the periphery and semi-periphery attempts to neuter the revolutionary capacity of the proletariat of imperial nations, imbued in their class position through higher wages, social benefits, and an overwhelming, choking abundance of commodities, cheap and expensive, in all facets of life. The result is the formation of a labor aristocracy, highly privileged, skilled workers in the imperial core whose salaries reflect not just the cost of their labor power, but also the monetary concessions accrued by the working class through years of struggle, now provided for, in part, by the exploitation of workers outside the imperial core. This process of extraction of global production, capital flows and investment, chasing inevitably lowering rates of profit and surplus value, is the essence of modern imperialism. This is the development of capitalist exploitation and value extraction as a world system. This is a reality faced by the international proletariat as a whole, across all nations. The importance of this critique, of a Marxist critique of imperialism, in determining the orientation and strategy of any serious social organiza socialist organisation in Australia cannot be understated, <coughs> or overstated. Um, liberal critics of imperialism speak on its moralist injustice as a system. They loudly protest against the most apparent violations of their fetishized international law and systems of checks and balances, yet cannot go beyond this. The character of general liberal criticisms of imperialism is flawed twofold. First, it broaches only single instance resulting from imperialism, from a moralistic standpoint, complaining of their violation of abstracted liberal ideology and ethics in the form of human rights and refusing to go beyond this rather than a serious criticism of imperialism itself, founded upon the social relations, economic and political, that compose it as a system of fundamental exploitation, liberal criticisms largely point only to effect, with a minimal ability to decry cause. This is the criticism offered by the NGO industrial complex, built upon liberal humanist ideology, which is swift to decry Congolese child labor or Bangladeshi sweatshops 
without comprehension of the social factors that drive forward these reprehensible conditions, namely the search of international capital for the highest possible rate of profit and greatest possible extraction of surplus value. The second point of flaw in liberal critique of imperialism that exposes its intellectual bankruptcy is the failure to identify imperialism as both essential to and a defining feature of modern imperialism and globalization, modern capitalism and globalization. As liberal criticisms of imperialism often lack any analysis of exploitation and its global social relation to production, they fail utterly in drawing the clear line between imperialism and capitalism as a world system. They do not see either as linked, or if they do, they perceive such a link as merely incidental or temporary, rather than a connection that betrays the inextricable connect link between imperialism and contemporary capital that cannot be undone without the undoing of capitalism itself. Thus, they cannot reach the political conclusions drawn from such economic analysis and critique, and fail to make the leap to the politics of international revolution, of the emancipatory destru destruction of imperialism and capital through the force of an international proletarian class. The necessity of a disciplined, scientific, Marxist criticism of imperialism, as roughly outlined earlier, to revolutionary communists in Australia is thus demonstrated through the inadequacy of any and all liberal critique, much of which continues to, unfortunately, influence the criticisms Australian Marxists had echo of imperialism. While the left, more specifically socialists, oppose the sabre rattling and ex inexorable expenditure on the imperial war machine in Australia, our critique of imperialism necessitates going far beyond simply pointing to a crumbling, neglected welfare state. Indeed, here in Australia, immediate demands simply for a return to the efficient welfare state, to a benevolent management of capital, totally disregard the simple fact that this supposed welfare state was built only upon 200 years of colonial occupation and the later imperialist super profits reaped by Australia and its allies in the imperial core. The decay of the welfare state is emblematic of the decay in the objective conditions of global capital. But it is not enough. It is not acceptable for Marxists to advocate for a return to this welfare state founded upon imperialism itself. This does not mean an abandonment of the revolutionary potential of the proletariat in Australia. Indeed, a principled clarification of imperialism lends itself with inevitability and with certainty to the absolute necessity of the international revolution and the international proletarian struggle. Despite often benefiting implicitly from imperialism, the fundamental character of the Australian proletariat's relations to production remains unchanged. They remain exploited. They remain dominated by capital. And they remain placed in the very position which provides the basis for a revolutionary class consciousness. However, as capitalism degrades, as conditions slide or are forced backwards for workers internationally in order to extract <coughs> every drop of profit, we cannot simply join the oft-reactionary call for a turn to a system of welfare predicated on global exploitation. Our demands must reach beyond this. Even in the positing of immediate and transitional demands, revolutionary communists must not simply advocate for the welfare state once gained or anything within parameters acceptable to capital. We must advocate for demands that sharpen the contradictions of capitalism, that force its reckoning with itself, that if implemented, would be disastrous for capitalism, both globally and locally. If and when we do raise the slogan of welfare, it must not be backwards to the return of the welfare state, but rather forwards to a life worth living. The importance of this, and the importance of a principled Marxist criticism and formulation of imperialism, has become and will only become increasingly vital to the organising efforts of communists in Australia. To quote from the first edition of the RCO program, capitalism, in experiencing its prolonged demise, has committed itself wholly to the altars of imp imperialist war and ecocidal extraction, to the modern Moloch of techno-capital, the foul demiurge of race, nation, and empire. As imperialist wars rage on in Ukraine and in Palestine, as imperialist tensions heighten in the South China Sea and in the Asia Pacific as a whole, due to the long decline of capitalism's objective conditions
and the ripening of revolutionary ones, socialists must have the answers. We must present an analysis, a comprehensive understanding of capitalism as a world system and imperialism as a funda fundamental aspect of it. And we must organise and orient our strategy in line with this, to meet the objective conditions of revolution with the subjective heightening of organisation, of tactics and a proletarian class struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony and David. Do you want to close us out? Yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon, comrades, and thank you to Platypus for the invitation to come along and join this discussion. I think the starting point for understanding imperialism is that it is a global system. It's a global system of contestation between the major industrials, industrial states. And it's important that we look at it at that level, uh, because as I've gone on to some of the examples, I think the left can become severely disoriented when they fail to look at uh, the interplay of uh, imperialist rivalry. So let's be blunt, there are six or seven major imperialist powers. The United States, which is uh, hegemonic in terms of its military power, but is declining uh, economically, in, uh, certainly in relative terms. There is China, which is now arguably uh, the most important economic power in the world, or is certainly very close to becoming that, uh, and is growing its military to, to match that. There is Russia, which is economically very, very weak, but still has an enormous military arsenal. And then there, of course, there are Britain, France, um, and, and, and so on. And these imperialist powers are locked into a series of, uh, of rivalry over a whole series of issues. They're locked into a series of rivalry over access to markets, control of sea lanes, uh, control of regions in order to be able to facilitate the operation of their capitalist, uh, capitalist op operations. And that means there is a constant process of friction, which can sometimes lead to outright war, friction that can lead to metal-on-metal uh, um, metal contact, uh, as, as it's been called in the, in the South, South China Sea. Each of those imperialist nations is trying to carve out a larger sphere of influence. It's not about colonies anymore. We do have to update imperialism since Lenin, although, of course, we all owe uh, a great debt of gratitude to Lenin for the work that he did. It's no longer about colonies. There are very few formal colonies left in the world. It's not just about the specific profits that can be uh, uh, screwed out of one particular region or another. The US did not sacrifice an enormous amount of, uh, of its uh, of, of human life and treasure in order to try and con contact, uh, uh, in order to beat the national liberation movement in Vietnam because it could make a lot of money in Vietnam. It was part of a worldwide struggle between superpowers, which at that stage uh, the rivalry was dominated by the Soviet Union as a state capitalist power and, and the United States. The United States is self-sufficient in oil at the moment, but has an enormous strategic interest in dominating the Middle East, not because it actually needs the oil, which is under Iran, Iraq, and, and other countries in the region, but because having leverage over the, uh, the means by which that oil is extracted and exported allows it to dictate terms to a number of countries which are entirely dependent on fossil fuel imports whether it's allies like Japan or rivals like, uh, like China. So imperialism is not reducible to what money can be made out of a particular region or particular site, but of course it's driven by the desire from each of those imperialist nations to be able to create the best possible circumstances for its capital to exploit around the world. I'd say in passing, it's something we can take up in discussion in terms of Anthony, Anthony's contribution I think uh, dependency theory has been thoroughly discredited. I think the biggest problem with the global south is not its super exploitation, but the fact that the capitalists by and large have no interest in investing in the global south, particularly in Africa. There are huge regions uh, of the world where simply there is no investment going in, and, and, uh, and the countries continue to be um, uh, locked into, uh, into poverty. There's small pockets around mining or, or other such specific industries. And I would 
Party would reject completely the idea that the uh, working classes in the advanced countries are, are beneficiaries of imperialism. Uh, I think Lenin was wrong on the question of uh, the labor aristocracy, the working class in the, in the industrialized countries as forming some kind of industrial, uh, 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 industrial aristocracy. I would reject the idea that the welfare state represents the screwing of super profits out of the global south. On the contrary, the, the welfare state represents the working class, particularly in the post-Second World period, in the uh, advanced industrial countries, screwing profits out of its own ruling class in order to spread the, uh, the benefits. Now, the reason for talking about imperialism, insisting that imperialism has to be understood as a global system of contestation, is it allows us to understand two particular flashpoints in the world at the moment. The first of those is Ukraine. Solidarity argues that the Ukrainian conflict is a proxy war between Russia and the United States and its allies, that uh, while it started with a Russian invasion, which we reject, in reality, Ukraine is fighting an American finance and to a large extent an American directed war to weaken Russia as, a, as one of its imperialist rivals. And uh, for once, I would agree with Neil, we would call on the Russian workers and the Ukrainian workers and soldiers to turn their guns against their own ruling classes. The victory of Ukraine would be a victory for Western imperialism, a victory for Russia would be a victory for Russian imperialism. The working class in both countries, Ukraine and Russia, have no interest in, uh, in uh, either of those outcomes. I think it also allows us to make some sense of the situation around Taiwan, and the conflict in the South China Sea. Solidarity argues that Taiwan is effectively an out outpost of US imperialism on China's east coast, and the left should not fall into the trap. As such, I'm not talking about comrades here today, but so many on the left have fallen into the trap of supporting Ukraine in the name of national liberation, and the largest left organization, I meant to face it, we're all very small, but the largest of the small left organizations have actually come in behind Ukraine and I would say objectively have come in behind Western imperialism in calling for the arming of Ukraine and the victory of Ukraine. We should not fall into that trap a second time in the case of Taiwan. Calling for victory to Taiwan against China objectively is calling for the victory of the United States against China. And again, it's only in calling for the revolutionary upheaval of Chinese workers, Taiwanese workers and workers in the West that we can break the impasse and the risk of and the risk of war. I want to move on to something which really I think has interestingly have not been talked about, and that is Australian imperialism. Because Australia is an imperialist country in its own right. It is a small imperialist country and incapable of projecting power on a global scale, unlike the major imperialist powers I've outlined outlined. But Australia is not a minor imperialist country either. It's the 13th biggest spender on, mili on military items in the world. And that's before the obscene, ex extent, um, obscene expenditure on nuclear propelled submarines, <coughs> hypersonic missiles, an increase in the number of men and women in uniform, and all the expansion of uh, military materiel that uh, first the Liberals and now the Labour Party are projecting. So Australia is a significant uh, military force. It actually has uh, troops on the ground in the Middle East, uh, but it's primarily in this region that Australia projects its power, because it's a sub-imperialist power. It's, a, it's, a re it's an imperialist power within a region rather than on a global scale. And so, for instance, there are Australian uh, ships patrolling in the South China Sea. There was an Australian warship that went through the Taiwan Strait just a week or so ago. There are Australian planes overflying the South China Sea and around the Korean border. And of course, there are um, Australian, uh, Australian troops. There's Australian uh, submarines patrolling. There is uh, Australian planes flying out of uh, an airfield in Malaysia. There, the Australian government is spending $500 million on improving um, for military purposes the airfields in the Cocos Keeling Islands, which we never think about, but they're actually very close to Jakarta, 
and uh, the plans which are deployed off that airstrip are effectively a threat to the Indonesian government, a dagger to the heart of the Indonesian government. So the Australian uh, government is itself demanding over its own, uh, its own um, imperialist uh, operations, but because it is a smaller imperialist operation, it has always needed a major imperialist power as a guarantor. That used to be the Britain, that used to be Britain and the British Empire, now it's the United States. But we should not fall into the trap, as so many do on the left, of seeing Australia as America's lapdog. Australia is not involved in American wars because America is powerful and tells Australia what to do. Australia is involved in American, America's wars because the Australian ruling class regard that as a down payment on the future support of the US ruling class for its control in, in the region. And the Australian ruling class has actually demanded to be let into the Vietnam War. They demanded to be let into the, the, Gulf, the Gulf War. They wanted to take part in that war because they understood that taking part in that war would, guarantee, would support American imperialism, which in turn would guarantee the control of Australian imperialism in the region. My final point is this, why does it all matter? Why are we here on a, a drizzly summer's afternoon in Melbourne discussing these issues? Uh, it's, for me, it's not because we're, you know, we're all philosophical, you know, philosophers. As Marx observed, you know, philosophers have merely uh, interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. And I would say that the, the reason to understand the nature of imperialism today is to be able to fight to break the Australian working class from support for imperialism. Because in the process of fighting to break the Australian working class from support, uh, support for imperialism, we enhance the possibility of working class revolution in this country. Now, that's a big statement, but I think when we break it down into the small chips of struggle, I think, I think we see a couple of things. Uh, Neil mentioned an open letter which Solidarity actually played a critical role in initiating. That open letter, uh, support for the Palestinian struggle amongst trade unionists has been signed by uh, three and a half thousand trade unionists endorsed by a number of union branches. More importantly, it spawned a whole series of open letters in specific unions and, um, and, 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 and workplaces. Now, Neil scoffs that that letter doesn't specifically denounce the Labour tops in the particular language which the Spartacists may use. That letter played an incredibly important role. What was that role? It argued for support for the Palestinian people with no concessions to the both sidedism that infects so much of the, the liberal left and in and large sections of the trade union movement and certainly many people in the Labour Party who will not say a word for Palestine without first condemning Hamas and calling for the release of the hostages. That statement is an unambiguous statement of solidarity with Palestine, calling for the end of uh, occupation and the apartheid state. What does that mean? It means victory to the Palestinian resistance. And that argument has begun to be taken up in sections of the trade union movement, and we are very proud of the fact that we led that process. How does that translate? When the Zoom ship came into Port Botany a couple of weeks ago, because of the work that our comrades have done in collaboration with others, and because we have members in the Maritime Union in Sydney, 500 unionists turned out at Port Botany to oppose the docks. 10 members of the MUA were on that protest. It was endorsed by the MUA uh, Sydney branch. When it was attacked by the police, it was our comrades were arrested not yours, our comrades arrested for standing firm for union action against, against, against Palestine. That is practical anti-imperialism in Australia today, taking the argument in the, into the union movement to win support for Palestine, laying the basis for working class uh, solidarity. We are proud that our comrades played a role in the week of action at the University of Melbourne this week in solidarity with Palestine at RMIT University, and that the teachers and support staff were out on Friday in the teeth of vicious attacks by the state government and the media, standing up for the right for teachers and school support staff, 
to stand up for Palestine. If that wasn't radical enough for you comrades, I'm sorry. But I do not apologise that we take our revolutionary perspective and actually try and turn it into struggle today, into resistance today, into building working class confidence today. And if that is not radical enough for you, I'm guilty. Thank you, David. Um, we'll now go to uh, some responses from the uh, panellists, and I encourage during this time the panellists to engage with each other's opening statements and ask questions of each other. Feel free to respond in time in more of a dialogue uh, if you so choose. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Um, well, uh, it is good that David addressed the role of Australian imperialism in the US-led war drive against China um, and made a totally correct point that there needs to be a break of the Australian working class from imperialism. How is that to be done? Uh, one of the most pertinent things coming off of Lenin's analysis of uh, imperialism is precisely the understanding and the lesson that he drew is that if you, need, if you want to fight imperialism, then you've got to fight the supporters of imperialism within the working class. And most importantly, uh, those peaceniks and conciliators of those pro-imperialists within the working class. That is the barrier and the obstacle that retards the working class from being able to act in its own inter independent interests against imperialism. So, you can have a petition, and boy, it, got a, it did get a lot of names. But what, is, uh, what does the struggle in defence of the Palestinian people today require? What can the working class here in Australia do? One simple move by the working class to ban military shipments to Israel would do 1,000 times more than a protest on the docks that holds up an Israeli ship for one or two hours. Um, that's not union action. Yeah. Um, in fact, part of the purpose of those sort of actions is precisely to enable uh, the union leadership, and David reeled off the fact that several, so, so many MUA members were at this protest. They use actions like this precisely uh, to cover for the fact that they are opposed to imposing union bans against military shipments to Israel or taking concrete action by, the union, by those unions protesting against the role of the Australian imperialists in backing uh, Israel in its slaughter of the Palestinian people today. Um, you know, this stuff about dependency theory and all this sort of stuff, um, frankly, is bullshit. Marxism, the main thing about it is it is, it is a guide to action. You cannot divorce your analysis of the world from what needs to be done. And this is the most critical thing today. The question is, what program do you advance in order to be able to mobilise the working class against imperialism, in order to be able to break the working class from the open pro-imperialist uh, leaders and from those who effect, those who maintain, you, those who claim they oppose imperialism, but in fact maintain unity with those very same pro-imperialists. Um, and I think in practice, uh, solidarity, in fact, uh, what they do is they actually provide a cover for those very bureaucrats who refuse to carry out the sort of action that is necessary. And the RCO, um, like I said, can uh, uh, say many fine words, but they, they put forward no concrete perspective of mobilising the working class in independent action in the here and now uh, and, breaking to, and breaking them from the obstacle for them acting uh, in their own interests against imperialism. That's it. Thank you. 
Anthony. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, certainly think all speakers today have had extremely good and relevant points. Um, David, I think your conversation on imperial, inter-imperialist rivalry and how it shapes the imperial world system is incredibly important. It's certainly an aspect that needs to be discussed in the context of worker organising, proletarian organising, proletarian internationalism. Um, it's extremely important that the task in, task at hand, as Neil stated, in the struggle against the struggle against imperialism is breaking workers from the ALP, um, or at least the ALP represents the major obstacle to an independent mass socialist workers party in this country. <coughs> What I think the RCO disagrees with in terms of the proposal in the strategic program of the Spartacists uh, has to do with the characterization that the way to break workers from the LP, or indeed the strategic importance of doing so as the, mo the top priority, it seems, is misplaced. Um, we can break union bureaucracy and we can attempt to, without, we can break the LP without participating and enter, entering into the LP itself without that direct um, and explicit policy of attempting to split the party itself. I think this is <coughs> Solidarity's No Orcas Coalition is in some ways a more direct response in that it attempts to mobilise independently um, socialists and workers in an anti-imperialist struggle, which I think it should be the primary focus. Um, <coughs> The RCO's opposition to lesser imperialism is a critical component of our own internationalism. I don't remember who brought this up, but Ukraine and Russia has been talked about and discussed multiple times throughout this uh, panel so far. Groups are quick to propose programs of strategy and direction, but don't seem to understand the fundamental limitations of their own size and structure. What good does a strategic program fleshed out in full do for the workers of Russia and Ukraine when we have no way of influencing or even transmitting such policy to them? It, the most sensible and direct application is of revolutionary defeatism as such. Um, of, of course, as I think we all agree here, you know, turning the guns of um, Ukrainian and Russian soldiers against their masters. <coughs> and I think in that sense, the RCO maintains the principled revolutionary defeatist position. Um, <coughs> what else do we have here? I think we, the RCO tends to agree with David's characterization of Australian imperialism in some respects. We would see them as sub imperialists, however, they do hold substantial sway over the Asia Pacific and engage in imperialist activities within the region itself. Although in many cases they do defer to the US, to the greater imperial power, as is, you know, subject of their own relations and political um, structure. That's really about it. Yeah. Thank you. David? Yeah, yeah, just one thing, and it may have been a slip of the, the tongue by Anthony, but you referred to our as in solidarity's no authors coalition. Um, if people are not familiar with the No Authors Coalition, it's actually Stalinist's No Authors Coalition. Um, the center of gravity in the organizing committee is absolutely uh, with Stalinists, uh, and Solidarity plays a role, uh, but quite a minor role in that coalition. And the most significant part of our role is to try and popularize, um, firstly popularize the argument against war with China, because many people are rather reluctant to take that up, and we think that's the sharp edge of challenging Australian imperialism in the, in the context of the, uh, of, the re of the region. And secondly, to challenge left nationalism. Left nationalism is hegemonic uh, on the left outside of really pockets of revolutionary socialists. And the idea that Australia is simply a lapdog of the Americans, it's expressed in a number of ways, uh, progressively, that Australia should break from the US alliance, agree with that, but then negatively it's expressed that Australia should build up its own uh, military independence, which I think is no way forward for the working class. So that's just by the by. I, I think the single most important question, this is the second time today I've agreed with Neil, so, and this is being recorded, so I'm listening to the answer. But the critical question is, is what is to be done? 
to be a guy called Lenin, and I thought that a novelist came up with that, 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 uh, that question. What is to be done around the question of uh, the struggle for solidarity with Palestine? I agree that a, a real ban on, on Zim, which is the Israeli shipping company that comes in and out of our ports, or a real ban on the manufacture of the parts for uh, F-35 jet fighters, out of, which are made in Bayswater, the only place in the world that this particular little plastic gidget is made. A real union ban on that would have more impact than a thousand demonstrations. I completely agree with that. The question is, how do we get to that point in circumstances where firstly, sections of the working class are confused about the entire Palestinian issue? Even though, uh, uh, even though, and there are a growing number of workers who support Palestine are horrified by the genocide and the bombing and all the rest of it they see on their screen. <laughs> how, do we, how do we overcome the inertia and passivity that we have had with low levels of strike action really since the accord of the Labour Party in the early 1980s? We're living with a generation plus of passivity in the working class movement that needs to be overcome. How do we get those bans when the anti-union laws threaten the unions with massive fines? Now, I don't think any of those things are obstacles to winning, but they are challenges that we have to take on quite seriously. By the way, I have led an illegal strike. It, it can be done, uh, and we won't. It's something that uh, workers can do. The anti-union laws can be broken. And I've got you know, pers personal experience of that if people want to find out later on exactly what, what happened and where and how. Solidarity strategy is this, that while we look to the power of the working class to impose real bans, to, uh, to put a spoke in the wheel of the Israeli war machine, to get there we have to take a number of steps in order to build up political clarity and confidence among sections of workers. And that's why we've argued for quite modest things like uh, collect and, and collective action, but quite on quite a modest scale. So in many workplaces, wearing the kafir to work or wearing Palestine badges to work as a collective, taking a group photo and posting it on social media, which is certainly not going to overthrow Australian capitalism or Israeli capitalism, is the first step towards the idea that workers can take some kind of collective action in order to act for Palestine. See, I mentioned that there were 10 MUA members amongst those on the, on the waterfront of Botany. That wasn't a union ban, but I have to say that the threat of the demonstrations led to uh, the shipping question being offshore for days without docking, the captain telling his crew, and we know this from the inside because we have members in the MUA, the captain telling his crew he wanted to get in and out of Botany Bay as quickly as possible. We know that at least one crew member on that ship spoke up in support of Palestine. I mean, this is the beginning of wisdom, comrades. If you want to talk about international working class solidarity, most of these ships will be crewed by low paid workers from Southeast Asia. To speak up for Palestine under those circumstances is an incredibly brave thing to do. The, the white collar workers at Botany were sent home early. Truck, uh, slots because trucks coming onto the waterfront are given particular times to turn up and load or unload. Truck, truck slots were cancelled. Uh, trucks were held up outside the docks. There was not a formal union ban on that ship, but that was the closest we had so far to a collective action holding up the is, uh, Israeli ships and therefore the Israeli, is, Israeli economy. And that's one of the reasons why the cops came in so hard. They came in and brutalised that demonstration because that demonstration represented with its, its, its ripples actually on the waterfront amongst the workers. Palestinians, by the way, sent food into the waterfront, Palestinian dishes into the waterfront to the wharfies as an act of solidarity with the wharfies to encourage them to go slow. A number of people on the late shift turned up late we're talking about the closest we've come to that kind of action. And I am absolutely proud that Solidarity Comrades in Sydney were central, central to that. Um, I just want to make one more point, and this is going to be provocative, so let's be provocative. It 
it is a sign of impotence on the left, but the greater the impotence, that there's a general rule, they call it the glands law, because I don't know who else came up with it. There is a general rule on the left that the smaller, the more impotent the group, the more strident and ultra revolutionary the language, that people compensate psychologically for their inability to make any real change in the world around them by the greatest amount of ultra revolutionary posturing. Solidarity, I believe, has quite a modest approach. We know that we are a small organisation. The whole revolutionary left is tiny. We are one of the, we're bigger than the comrades here, but we're much, much smaller than we, we need to be. We understand that we are, we, we're operating with enormous lim limitations. But what we seek to do is at every point, whether it's in the refugee campaign, the campaign against AUKUS, or obviously now in the campaign for Palestinian solidarity, solidarity is identify the next step, argue for actual action that can take the campaign forward, Combine that with a political critique, which is ultimately aimed at our own ruling class and at Australian imperialism. And indeed, the audience that opens up, and it's a modest audience, but nonetheless, in the audience that opens up, we argue for revolutionary organisation and we argue for the building of a re re revolutionary party. I believe that's grounded in reality, and we actually are taking some positive steps forward. But we are growing, both in our modest influence and in our modest size. Simply going, denouncing, exposing, calling for programmatic unity, demanding the exactly, exactly correct program, finessing the words, all of that is a substitute for actually doing something in the real world. And this is a philosophical discussion, so I'll leave this final point. There is a question that needs to be grappled with, the difference between dialectics and formal logic. I would argue the comrades here are absolutely correct in terms of formal logic, that you need dialectical thinking to understand how we get from where we are today to where we need to get to into the future, and I think that's the way in which solidarity operates. Um, Neil, I think you want to respond to that provocation before I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, I think the best way to respond is simply uh, Concretely, the example that David uses, um, I guess, of the counterpose strategies between the bikes, the ship, one of the sharpest examples of the counterpose strategies between solidarity and Spartacist, the campaign to boycott uh, the Zimu ships. Um, I think uh, they may occasionally delay a ship, but the thing is, they do nothing to stop the Zionist onslaught. And they sit totally within a framework of appealing to imperialist governments to do the right thing by the Palestinians. Um, and this is encapsulated by well, you're saying that we appeal to imperialist governments. Can you actually provide any evidence for that? I am talking about these protests. This is encapsulated by the calls of the BDS movement for the imperialist rulers to do the morally correct thing and sanction Israel. That is counterposed to mobilising independent union action against the Israeli blitzkrieg. And it provides, like I said, a very convenient uh, out for the left union bureaucrats who absolutely refuse, who are great friends of Palestine, but absolutely refuse to organise concrete union action against both the imperialists and, and the Zionists. <clears throat> yeah. uh, if I could add, I when Solidarity speaks of ultra revolutionary language or that sort of, I mean, I'm going to characterise it more broadly, ultra leftism, if that's okay with you, not no, just no, ultra revolutionary no, abstraction. language. Abstraction. abstraction. All right. When Solidarity speaks on abstraction and it's, it's abstracted language, ultra revolutionary language, uh, and counterposes that to a pragmatic approach that they themselves claim to embody, I think comrades on the Australian left seem to have forgotten the distinction between agitation and propaganda and the unity of theory and practice. It is possible to practice both so-called ultra-revolutionary tactics, ultra-revolutionary strategy and language while also counterposing that with a more pragmatic strategy and more pragmatic orientation of certain social movements or groups and a participation in certain social movements or groups while un whilst understanding their limitations. 
think finding a balance between these is easy, absolutely not. And certainly, uh, I don't think any group on the Australian left has done so um, to a great extent or appropriately, but it's certainly a task we need to work, work towards because this supposedly old revolutionary language, I think, embodies some of the first aims of communists and socialists in Australia. It is appropriate formal logic and it can't be met simply by a co-negation of that supposedly ultra revolutionary language with pragmatism. Rather, you need a combination of both strategies, both orientations and perspectives in order to actually build a mass socialist workers party. You need to regroup the current left and uh, bring in uh, swathes of working class. Can I make one small response? Uh, again, it may be a slip of the tongue by answering this. I don't want to turn it into the biggest deal. Pragmatism. I'm not arguing for pragmatism. I'm arguing for taking the struggle forward. And taking the struggle forward sometimes means a group of teachers wearing a kafir to school and confronting their principal over the, over the issue. Uh, sometimes the struggle is, lead, is leading a strike, and that strike will not overthrow capitalism, but it will build the confidence of workers and raise their perspective about their part in, of, of being part in a class movement. So I wouldn't call that pragmatic. It's, it's concrete because it steps outside the realms of just you know, the literature on our, on our various bookstores over, over there. But pragmatism implies pulling your punches. We're not pulling our punches. We're trying to operate as revolutionary socialists and taking the struggle forward. If all we did was pronounce the need for socialist revolution, the need for the working class to overthrow capitalism, the need for a revolution of party, I think we would be totally impotent and totally pure. Our, our challenge is to try and take those principles which we're all in agreement on in the broadest sense, the need to build a, a mass revolutionary workers' party, the need to lead, play a leading role in the struggle to overthrow Australian capitalism, but find points of purchase with people who only partly agree with us. Tony Cliff, who founded um, our tendency many, many years ago, used to say, what is leadership? Leadership is, take, is taking somebody in your workplace or campus or your friendship circle who agrees with you 10%, arguing with them and moving them over to 20% agreement. That is leadership. You don't shift people from total passivity to total revolution further. You have to win a series of arguments and it is much easier to win those arguments when you're actively engaging in, in struggles of, and movements of resistance. So despite our small size, solidarity plays a central role in the Refugee Action Collective. We participate and try and influence the No Orcas Coalition. We are taking part in unions for Palestine. We are leading the struggle inside teachers and school staff for Palestine and on, on a number of the campuses. We led the strike at the Prophet of St. Lawrence earlier this year, which if you don't know about it, is really important. It's the first strike, first extended successful strike by workers in the care, what we might call the care, uh, care sector, uh, and in the Australian Services Union, mainly ever. We do that and it opens up debate about why are workers important? What power do we have? How do we organise? What are the lessons of history? So there's a continuum between taking part in the, small, in the small nuts and bolts of struggle and then winning people to a revolutionary perspective and an understanding that we cannot peace, make peace with capitalism, that capitalism has to be destroyed, that we need our own October revolution in Australia. Um, I'll, I'll use my moderator's prerogative to also provoke. Um, it seemed like there was some tension between Anthony and David on the nature of the welfare state. In, in particular, uh, in the period where Marx himself uses the phrase imperialism, starts really using it around the early 1850s, he's, he's describing the taking up by the state of the question of workers' welfare and workers' employment, that the, the state starts becoming involved in, in this question. Then again, in, in the early 19th, early 20th century, there the state is confronted by the demands of a working class that are demanding social welfare, pension systems, and stuff. So there's, and certainly in the early 
20s or so, the communist parties were opposed to a lot of the state welfare measures as in some sense buying off or placating the workers movement. So how does, how does the question of the, the welfare state relate to the question of imperialism and uh, how should that orient our politics? Uh, Neil, do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, Anthony. Uh, I think I made myself quite clear in the speech, but to reiterate, uh, the RCO, or at least I, as a member of the RCO, would make the argument that the modern welfare state, in its sense, the, the buying off of workers, so to speak, through those privileges, through those access to social services, is done and subsidised in part by imperialist policy um, and the value extracted from imperialist workers. After the loosening of protectionist policies and the so so-called national economy in the mid-20th century, I think global capitalism spread its tendrils globally, so to speak, in pursuit of profits to, in part, compensate for the victories earned by the working class in the early 20th century. Uh, I think, of course, the imperial world system benefits Australian workers, not just through, you know, perhaps subsidising these welfare measures, but also simply through the incredible overabundance of cheap commodities Australian markets are provided with from imperialist exploitation and the, the um, labour done by imperialised workers at a significantly lower labour power cost than workers in Australia. It's what makes fundamentally, you know, I mean, it's an aspect of unequal exchange, but that, um, yeah, that's how I characterise the welfare state. David, do you have any? Any comments? Yeah, there are two thoughts. Firstly, as Marxists, we understand exploitation uh, is the extraction of surplus value, and that actually workers in the advanced countries can be, and often are, in Marxist terms, more exploited than workers in the global south. Now, exploitation is a common sense term, uh, applies to people, you know, very low wages, overworked, whether it's in, you know, a cafe in in Melbourne, or more importantly, in the global south. But actually, exploitation in a Marxist sense is the extraction of surplus value. And actually, for instance, CSL up in Broadmeadows, the bit part of the big pharma, it's Australia's third biggest com uh, company. Um, the workers up there would be more highly exploited in Marxist terms than uh, somebody working, for instance, in a t shirt sweatshop in, in Bangladesh. What I mean by that, in Marxist terms, is the amount of surplus value extracted from each worker would actually be vastly bigger. Now, of course, their working circumstances are not as bad as the sweatshop, but we're not moralists here. We're talking about uh, Marxist understanding. Um, and I make that point to reinforce the fact that actually it's not super-exploitation of the proletariat in the global south that funds Medicare. It's actually the exploitation of the working class in Australia that funds Medicare. And the working class fought a historic fight. It included a very passive bureaucratic, because uh, Bob Hawke was the leader of it, but it included a general strike to fight for Medicare. Why? Because Medicare represents a historic achievement for the working class in Australia. And as somebody who's actually spent quite a bit of time going through the hospital system as a Medicare patient in the last 18 months, I say, Three cheers for Medicare. It's uh, an enormous difference uh, in, in people's lives. The welfare state, are we going to condemn uh, job seeker? The only reason to condemn job seeker is it's not high enough. Are we going to condemn support for single parents? The only reason to condemn it is the amount is high enough. The welfare state is of massive importance for the working class in this country, and it's funded by the profits generated by Australian capitalism. The idea that we are living off the backs of t-shirt workers in Bangladesh who produce cheap t-shirts to sell at Kmart is a fantasy. Of course their treatment is abominable. Of course they should organise. Of course we should offer solidarity. But that is not the, the, the core element. And I challenge, I challenge anybody on the left to step out of their revolutionary bubble and go and tell a nurse or an orderly down at the Royal Melbourne or any other hospital of your choosing down with the welfare state because it's stopping you from fighting capitalism. Go and tell them that. Go on, I dare you. Any other thoughts on, on that question? <coughs> uh, simply, I'd say that 
the RTO and no socialist group, or at least no reasonable ones, are going to condemn the systems just mentioned, job seeker, Medicare, what have you, but rather make clear the systems in place that allow for workers in Australia to have these, these benefits in the first place. That's the fundamental aspect of it. It's not a principle of denouncing people on job seeker, it's some sort of Yes, yes. Well, just to make clear, it's about clarifying the processes and structures that allow for these benefits. Um, and I simply would just, like, I think this is just a matter of disagreement over basic theoretical principles, that I, I would disagree simply with the argument that workers more broadly in the imperial core are more exploited in the Marxist sense than workers in the periphery and semi-periphery. Um, e even if in certain cases, uh, in the case of specialised labour and uh, such, there are certain workers in the Imperial Corps who suffer greater rates of exploitation. That's about it. Okay, well on that note, we'll take our short five minute break. Uh, we'll start again at 2.35. Uh, we'll put the kettle on and the toilets at the back and browse the literature and then I'll pick us up again when we're ready to go.
So we're going to have maybe about 80 minutes of Q&A, uh, and as I said before, we prefer to take only questions, uh, so the quicker you, the more direct you can ask the question, if you have it to the whole panel or to a specific panelist, just say, and if you can stay at the microphone um, one at a time until the question's been answered, in case there's any clarifications, feel free to follow up on the question quickly as well. I'll take a speaking list as I go, and Okay, I already see a lot of interest. And I'll, I'll um, so keep put your hand up, and I'll keep looking around and, and taking it as a go. Um, I'll start with Charlotte, and then yeah, please come up, and then Alison, and then I'll I'll come over here. Arthur, no, please, Charlotte, come up, ask a question.
for the um, Labour Party as such. I also would disagree with what I feel, or what I'm getting a sense of, is a conflation between the workers' movement as such and the Labour Party. Although the Labour Party, of course, has significant power and influence over unions and recruits from them immensely, I think to conflate the two is simply incorrect. There are workers' movements and workers' power, workers' organisation, that does not take place expressly within the Labour Party. And participating in unions is important for any communist organisation um, and doesn't necessitate participating in the Labour Party. Any other comments on that, or should we go to the next question? Alison, please go next. Putin 
no solidarity with the Russian ruling class. Um, and that's why our position is for soldiers who work on both sides to revolt against their own, um, their own rulers. But in the case of Ukraine, I think it's, we need to be quite concrete. What are people fighting for? Zelensky has already made it clear that Ukraine would be in NATO, that it would be, and this is his words, not mine, it would act as a big Israel um, at, the, at the heart of Eastern Europe. The right to strike, the right to organise is already under massive attack inside Ukraine, and it is quite clear that the quid pro quo for the Western end of Ukraine, if they succeed, and at the moment, to be honest, it's, it's a deadlock, militarily speaking, no one is winning, um, but if Ukraine were to succeed, there would almost certainly be, in, in, as a payback for the Western support, they would open up the privatisation of massive amounts of state-owned agricultural land in Ukraine. And Ukraine is one of the most productive agricultural areas in the world. And it's currently Western corporations are locked out of that market. And I think uh, the end of the, the, uh, the war, if it was to be on Ukraine's terms, would see a massive expropriation of small farmers uh, in Ukraine. It would see um, uh, 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 an eradication of independent working class activity, a neoliberalization of Ukraine on a, on, on a massive scale. Is that worth fighting for? No. Is that worth dying for? No. Turn your guns on your own officers and march on Kiev and, and take power there because that would inspire Russian workers and soldiers to do the same. We know there is massive disaffection in Russia. Most of it is passively expressed. It's, it's, it's measured in terms of people fleeing overseas, people faking uh, conditions in order to avoid being called up to the drug. That same problem in Ukraine, right? Uh, Small-scale protests, symbolic protests. The war is not popular for many people in Russia either. So I think to call for people to turn against the Roman class is not abstract, uh, it's not easy, but I think it is realistic and it is after all the position of the Bolsheviks in Russia um, and the position of genuine revolutionary socialists at the time of the First World War. On Palestine, uh, solidarity does not call for a ceasefire. Nowhere in our material do we call for ceasefire. We call for stop the bombing, but that's politically different. For, uh, for, for the ceasefire. We will not fight against the call for ceasefire because that's an in initial step against Israeli barbarity. But clearly a ceasefire that le merely leaves the status quo before the war began is not justice, it's not liberation. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Neil, do you want to respond as well? Well, just on that particular question, um, we don't see any fundamental difference between the call for a ceasefire or ending the bombing. It will resolve absolutely nothing in terms of the, str the struggle for Palestinian liberation today. Um, I think, as I observed in my presentation, I think the RCO have right, rightly characterised the demand for self-determination of Ukraine as basically a cover um, for a social chauvinist position of support for one's own uh, imperialist powers. And uh, the imperialists it, that, that we uh, particularly <laughs> need to oppose in terms of the Ukraine war uh, is uh, right here where we are in Australia against Australian imperialism. Uh, you're 100% behind um, NATO, and what has not been referred, what has not been mentioned here again by any of the other panelists in terms of the role of the union bureaucracy in this country, um, whether they are uh, at the leadership of the ACTU or the, or the so-called militants in the Maritime Union of Australia, who 100% are behind uh, the Australian government uh, in supporting NATO's war effort in the Ukraine. Um, I uh, would like to just briefly respond to something that Anthony Anthony's response to the last question there, where I think he sort of um, counterposed um, the question of regroupment and breaking the working class from the Labor Party. The Spartacist League and Bolshevik Leninists are today looking at a regroup, potential regroupment, 
precisely on the basis of a fight to break uh, the working class from their labour misleaders. That is a recognition that this is a central strategic question to be able to mobilise the working class to go forward against imperialism. Uh, and that is encapsulated in, that, uh, in our fight, uh, which we fight for today, uh, continue to fight for, which is to dr drive the Orcus Hawks out of the Labour Party and out of the union movement. Anthony, did you have anything to say? Uh, I commend the potential recruitment of the Bolshevik Islamists and the Spartacists. I think that's, that is a step forward for any sort of unity uh, in the communist and socialist left in Australia, really. Um, however, again, I would, uh, the art show would disagree with the strategy that's being undertaken um, that's influenced such recruitment in terms of the, um, you know, principle interventionism on the basis of AUKUS or however you want to frame it, uh, you know, the breaking from labour in through such a method. Um, yeah, there's really not much else for me to add. I think I've said, stated the answer to that position quite plainly. Can I, can I say Please. a couple of words yes. on the labour question? Please. Uh, well, firstly, on a, on a practical level, workers have broken from labour. Most of the branches are shells. The tradition of significant working class participation in the Labour Party is long gone. And the party is largely a party of apparatchiks, of councillors and MPs and staffers, union officials, and would be uh, apparatchiks. Um, there are very few legitimate, genuine, independent voices inside Labour. To the extent they speak out, good for them, but the reality is it's uh, something of a sideshow. Uh, if you look at the opinion polls, Labour is running at about 31% voting intention. In other words, a big section of the working class isn't going to vote for Labour. That doesn't mean we've taken a big step forward, comrades. It just means that Labour has once again managed to demoralise its supporters, um, push a right-wing agenda, and drive its support base into the ground. But I just want to raise a bigger point, because it's easy to denounce Labour. I mean, some of its recent uh, statements, I mean, for instance, as a refugee activist, the way it responded to the High Court decision to abolish indefinite detention is absolutely scandalous. It's a total capitulation to, to racism, to treat people who are non-citizens in a completely different way from, from citizens. And you can't get angrier than me on that question. But I think it's a broader, a broader approach we have to understand that the Labour Party and the trade union officials are a particular expression in Australia of a social democratic consciousness. And social democratic consciousness exists wherever there's a working class. And social, regardless of if it's crystallized in the form of a union movement or a Labour Party, because after all, you don't have Labour Parties or rough equivalents in most countries around the world. But there's something which all workers hold in common, the better ones, and that's a social democratic consciousness. And what I mean by that is they understand that the world is shit. Uh, they understand that they're being hard done by, they understand that things aren't fair and that things aren't right, but they also feel unable to challenge the system that produces that inequality. And people find themselves trapped between good intentions about a bigger, a better world and an inability, uh, and a sense that they are unable to actually deliver real fundamental change. That situation will not change, however many revolutionary socialist organisations or individuals jump up and down uh, and denounce labourism. That will change on a mass scale when workers move into battle over whatever the issue happens to be at the time and find themselves having to fight against their own union officials and against the Labour Party and beginning to draw conclusions about their own power and the need for working class organisation that focuses on the interests of the class uh, rather on the interests of Australian capitalism. That doesn't mean we do nothing in the meantime, but I think that we should understand you can't break the working class from Labour, and more precisely from Labourism, in the absence of mass titanic struggles. What we can do is through the partial struggles of today lay the basis of a significant revolutionary pole of attraction that when struggles become much bigger, when the challenges for the working class become much greater, that there is a degree of trust in our politics and the degree
degree of trust in their comrades, and that we're large enough to be present in the men enough workplaces, enough working class communities, to provide the leadership that is necessary to go beyond frustration with capitalism, frustration with the union officials of labor, to actually revolutionary activity. So denounce labor to your heart's content, comrades. It won't do you a pinch of, a pinch of good. What is needed is building revolutionary organization in the here and now that can lay the basis for being part of a struggle that can smash laborism in the future. Okay, um, we're gonna take Arthur next and then Chris and, and, and then, sorry, I don't know your name. Is there anyone else after that on the list? Oh, there. Adam, Adam. Okay, so, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'll go you, and then you, and then Sam, and then comrades at the back. I see your hands. Okay, so. Okay, my question is for everyone here, and also in particular for the Comfort Alliance, who read out some prompts for this discussion, which I read it online, and it gave a quote from Moshe Bastani, mm -hmm. and then I wasted half an hour or so climbing through 18 pages of Moshe Bastani to get to that one and nobody discussed it here. And my question for everyone is, what are we to do with the pretense that there is a functioning left in Australia and that there are Marxists in Australia when we have a panel like this of anti-imperialists who basically want to surrender to Russian imperialism in Ukraine and who basically want no action whatsoever to stop genocide in Gaza, right? They're in favour, uh, uh, and I, I agree with Alison that cease, they're calling for a ceasefire and worse than calling for, you know, stop the occupation. But if anybody's going to do anything about an actual mass movement that is actually breaking out, which is quite rare, there hasn't been a mass protest against an imperialist activity for quite a long time. We would dispute as to how long because I've got different views on world events from the rest of you. But I think everyone would agree that this protest about Gaza is of a significantly different mass character. And here we have a panel of anti-imperialists who are telling us that they have competing visions of what is the best way to prove that their organisation is the one that should lead the struggle and challenge the lead it, right? Now, I was a 14-year-old Apparachi 16, 60 years ago. I was on the State Executive of the Young Labour Association. And at that time, the labour movement they're discussing and the union movement they're discussing existed. I mean, David's at least close enough to the real world to correctly point out that the ALT branches, <laughs> you know, <laughs> basically not existent now. Um, and also, I noticed a difference when he points out the pure posturing of the ALT there's a difference between his posturing, which is traditional... Better class of posturing. Yeah, it's a, it's a better class of posturing. That's exactly what I was going to say. It really is, right? But it reminds me of the trots that I did know when I was on the state executive of the Young Labour, the, the, the trots trying to infiltrate Young Labour in New South, in New South Wales, and of the trots that we had in the 60s in the Vietnam movement. They had to engage with real politics. They had to compete with different policies and programs of the Revisionist Party, which they insisted on calling the Stalinist, with the Maoists, which they also insisted on calling the Stalinist, and with the Labour Party, which was the dominant force. Right? And they had to actually you know, put forward their political lines. And sometimes they'd, they'd be on the same side as people who were working for a revolution, and sometimes they'd be on the opposite side, but they did exist in the movement. Whereas what we're, what we're faced with here is non-existence, protect, you know, walking zombies um, who have grown to have long ago be people who actually <laughs> support... Okay, so my question is, what are we to do about it? What are you going to do if, as platypus when you hear people discussing the welfare state? And on the one hand, they have um, the claim that it's off the backs of the oppressed workers in the third world. And on the other hand, they say that it's paid for out of the profits of the capitalists. So you're trying to have Marxist study groups for people who don't even know that the welfare state is paid 
is, is part of the cost of reproducing labour power and the extreme side, so it doesn't come out of profits, um, uh, and it comes out of wages. Uh, and, and the extreme side of the welfare state is a product of the immiseration and... Do you have a question? Do you want to... Sorry. Uh, my question is, how do we go about the fact of developing any the new mass movement that is starting to happen, how do we push aside the nonsense and start to have discussions about policy and tactics? For example, tactics on Gaza. The only thing that will stop the genocide in Gaza will be an armed intervention. The only armed intervention that is remotely plausible would be the Turkish Navy, which is already holding naval exercises, and the French Navy. There's nobody else that could do it. Now, you can call that the Ottoman Empire and the French Empire, and it certainly won't be progressively so. But the you're question. either for it, or, or you're another 15,000 dead within another month. Okay, anyone would like to take that question? Tactics relating to Gaza and Labour Party. Um, I mean, first I'd like to point out that uh, when we speak about the trots you did know, so to speak, or the, in the 60s, well, fundamentally, a lot of those groups failed. That's the reason why we're here today. Um, the tact, for whatever reason, whatever tactics, whatever disputed political strategies, didn't work out. We're in a decaying life. We have experienced a decay for the last, what, at least 20 years, um, far more. But the point is, the point of, I'd say, any panel is to discuss and critique and develop new ideas, new theories, new tactics that can actually achieve some modicum of success. Um, <coughs> now, when we talk about, we're talking about many things, I think that many things were addressed in the question or the statement that was made. One being, you know, the idea of, of supposedly surrendering to Russian imperialism. Well, again, I'd like to reiterate some points made in part by David, but also just in general. The self-determination as a right when we talk about Ukraine is an abstracted ideal. It's a question of, we are talking about an, an inter-imperialist conflict, an inter-imperialist rivalry. We can pose the exact same question. You can ask, why don't we support Russia if you, some, if you see them as the lesser imperialist in this conflict? It's the same basic logic of, well, well not even basic logic, but incorrect logic of somehow believing either side has a right to this fundamental notion of state sovereignty or to self-determination in an inter-imperialist conflict. Um, when you talk about what tactics, what orientation different groups have towards Gaza, towards the act of genocide, I think that it's an incredibly broad and diverse, I mean, it's just an immense situation to begin with. But I also am perhaps confounded by what comrades think is actually within the realm of possibility for any minor, extremely, well, an, an extremely uninfluential group here in Australia to achieve. We can have our tactics and our strategic orientation, and we all do. I think the Spartacists do. You make it quite clear you have a strategy and a program put forward for the Israeli and the Palestinian workers, and I believe Solidarity does as well. But the point is, it's very difficult for us to actually influence things beyond attempting to posit what we believe is the correct line. Um, I quite honestly, I didn't actually catch the second half of that question about military intervention, the, the debate around that. But yes, I mean, being here now is, of course, like as in right here in this situation, isn't where I believe anyone here would like the left to be. But frankly, it's where we are, and we need to figure out what to do about it. Um, and I don't think that's really going to be at all helped by blathering on about whether or not you know, where you know, well, simply this total self-isolation, really. Um, we need to move forward. David? I can't have time to make myself and have something to do it for me, but there you go. That's, that's a different point. The, I think the decaying left is, the left is very weak in Australia, and 30 or 40 years ago, there was a significant communist party, uh, and the Labour left had a much more distinct program and uh, approach to a whole series of questions. And obviously, by and large, that's gone. But I don't think the starting point for understanding that is what, you know, looking at our own natives. It's not 
the program wrong, did my predecessors in the international socialists get the program wrong in 1985 or whatever? And is that the reason why I'm sitting here today representing quite a modest organisation? No, the fundamental, fundamental reason that the left is weak in this country is that there was a crisis of income support struck between the NCTU, the Labour Party, and critically with the support of the Communist Party, which had a significant role inside the working class movement, inside the union movement, which essentially led to not a cessation of working class struggle, but a decline, which although it was bumpy, there was always often, there were always occasions when workers did fight. By and large, if you take a graph from a look from your point of view, that's the 1970s, and that's today. That's how working class struggle has gone. And at the end of the day, socialist ideas get purchased because of working class struggle. If you say to somebody, workers can change the world, they say, oh, it's very interesting. If you demonstrate to people that workers can change the world, actually, that's much more, co that's much more compelling. And so, yes, individual left groups have made grievous mistakes. The Stalinists, by and large, have gone out the back door because Stalinism uh, has been discredited. And the, the former Democratic Socialist Party has become the Socialist Alliance, which is a third worldish swap. Yes, there are all sorts of mistakes that the left has made, but it's not our fault that the accord was struck. My predecessors in the 80s fought against the accord, um, and other you know, good militants and leftists fought against the accord. But we're operating, as Marx would say, you know. We make history, but not in circumstances of our own choosing. It's not our fault that the accord strangled working class self-activity and made the ideas of the left much more marginal. Doesn't mean we give up, doesn't mean we don't try, doesn't mean it can't be turned around, of course it can, but we have to acknowledge the circumstances in which we're operating. Specifically in terms of Arthur or Albert's uh, questions about Gaza, I think the answer is twofold. It's not relying on Turkish sub-imperialism, French imperialism. Frankly, I think that's a bizarre idea. Um, it, the answer is twofold. One is to build a movement here that is strong enough and confident enough to actually put a spoke in the wheel of militarism. I won't repeat everything I've said, but I believe that there have been tiny steps made, and those tiny steps should be strengthened. We should magnify those steps and make it much more of a common sense that we take action against the military machine. And I think even to the extent that the government has shifted its rhetoric over the last eight weeks, even to the extent to which Chris Minns up in New South Wales, the Premier, went from, you will not march for Palestine to, oh, well, you are marching for Palestine, is because of the size of the movement uh, and the progress that we've made. But the real answer is actually the Arab working class rising up in support of Palestine. There is massive support for Palestine amongst Arab workers. Um, but to do so, they have to change their own rulers. Every single Arab ruling class is in lockstep with the West. Every single Arab ruling class is integrated into Frankfurt and London and New York. Every single Arab ruling class controls corporations and banks and is absolutely embedded into West, Western imperialism. And a consequence of that is nearly all the Arab ruling classes have struck peace deals with Israel Saudi Arabia would be the next if it hadn't been for the events uh, of 7th of October. So if the masses are going to rise up for Palestine, they can only do so by rising up against their own, their own leaders. And in Egypt, which is the most, it has opened doors for workers and students and the radicals to begin to organize. It, the first demonstrations against Mubarak in 2010 and 2011 were for Palestine because even the dictators in the Arab states can't smash down every protest for Palestine because they, they have to play along at least at, at a superficial level solidarity with Palestine. And comrades are reporting that today. The regime in Egypt and the no, ISIS had there. to call a protest, yeah, had to call a protest for Palestine. That had created a space for the independent left to come out onto the streets. In 2011, when the revolution overthrew Mubarak, the doors to Rafa were opened between Egypt and Palestine. That kind of struggle is possible, and I should just state for the record that Solidarity has comrades in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Kurdistan fighting for that perspective. Okay, Neil, do you want to have something?
quickly or should we move on to more questions? Um, sure, yeah. Um, I agree, I think, with uh, what Anthony said in terms of uh, the enfeebled state that the working class are in today as a product of the defeats uh, inflicted by the false program of their leadership in the preceding period, specifically uh, a leadership which is adapted to the predominant liberalist, liberal ideology of the US-led post-Soviet liberal world order. Uh, I think the glue that holds everything together for the imperialists is those elements within the workers' movement, within the trade unions who talk left but refuse to break with the open and naked pro-imperialists uh, who lead the working class uh, throughout the world today. Uh, David talk about the working class have broken from labour. Well, that's, that's just ludicrous. Look, I didn't say that. Um, I have been uh, in the CFMEU for decades, I'm currently in the AMWU. I can tell you very clearly that the Labor Party uh, very much command, commands the allegiance of the vast majority of the organised working class. Um, that is strategic. They must be broken from that. Um, you cannot ignore it. Um, now, earlier I guess, uh, David talked about, well, you've got to do this sort of, you know, bit by bit in terms of getting, advancing the consciousness of the working class. It's not a question of sort of whether you simply scream and proclaim that it needs to be done or you're sort of gradually chipping away working at it. The question is whether you're heading in that right direction. And I tell you, if you are, if you are uh, coddling the pacifist and left labour right leaders within the unions and the Labor Party, then you are heading, heading in the wrong direction. That is the problem. These people need to be exposed for what they are and exposed for their unity and covering for the pro-imperialist leadership of the working class. Thank you. We, st we still have 50 minutes, so I'm hoping to get through everyone, but if I can ask people to keep their questions short and their answers uh, to the point as well, we'll get through it all. Uh, I'm going to do Chris, gentleman here, then gentleman here, then Sam, then I believe some people at the back, I'll get to shortly. Please. Thank you. Uh, this discussion today is a lot about what is revolutionary leadership. All the panelists have uh, claimed to be revolutionary. Um, now, Lenin, during World War One, he waged a fight against imperialism. He defeated that fight with breaking workers from the social chauvinists and exposing its centrist uh, supporters like Kautsky. This was his main strategic perspective. Uh, which he applied in the revolution in 1917. Neil applied this approach in his presentation today uh, by pointing out that the left bureaucrats cover for the pro-imperialists uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, the pro-imperialists pro um, in the ALP. And, and these left bureaucrats stand as obstacles to an independent struggle for the working class against imperialism. Neil has asked both of the panellists, Anthony and David, you are both invited to answer the question, why don't you wage a political struggle against the left union bureaucrats who cover for the prime imperialist ALP leaders who are obstacles to revolution? Anthony first? Yep. Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm please. Sorry. No, please. Go ahead. No, I thought you said Anthony. Either. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Maybe um, yes. yeah. Uh, well, we would, and we want to, and we plan to, and we hope to. I mean, like, and the, of course we're extremely limited by, one, the size of our organisation, and two, the relative, I mean, youth, I suppose, of our organisation, being, you know, only had our first general congress in January this year. Um, <coughs> but the point is we just don't believe, we fundamentally disagree with the idea that the best way to wage such a struggle is through an intervention into the Labour Party, um, however you want to frame it. Of course, you need to break the working class from the Labour bureaucracy, from the left Labour bureaucracy, and from the union, like the union bureaucracy as such, but it doesn't necessarily need to be done through the specific strategy and tactics posed by the Spartacists and Bolshevik Leninists. Um, and I think that's just the simple point of disagreement. Um, I think David accurately uh, counterposed the idea of building independent workers' power through mass 
movement through Strike, through uh, intervention into unions on a rank and file basis. And I think broadly I'd agree with that. I'd also say that the character of the Labour Party is itself, I would disagree that it raises a social democratic consciousness. And rather I would say the character of the Labour Party has been, and since its inception, it is a corporatist party. It is one that protects corporate national interests. It's one that protects a bureau bureaucratic class uh, for the management of capital. It's not one that has ever represented any sort of working class movement as such in its real consciousness or even at a class conscious level. It's fundamentally, those are the characteristics of the modern labor party. And that is why it isn't worth, or we can't practically hope to intervene inside the Labour Party itself at this stage. Thank you. Um, the question was, as I understand it, why don't we wait for political battle against the uh, union officials, etc., etc.? We do. Just read our magazine. Every issue we, we actually outline the way forward, which is a critique of the Labour Party and where relevant to the trade union officials. So I would really advocate you not just to buy a copy of the magazine at, at the bookstall at the back, but go online. We, we produce an enormous volume of material, all of which is available and searchable on our Solidarity website. Um, but, and, and there are practical measures that we can take from time to time. So, for instance, uh, in New South Wales, our comrades ran a ticket called the Activist Teacher Network against the officials inside the Teachers Union, the New South Wales Teachers Federation, which has cut an absolutely abysmal pay deal with the incoming Labour government, and ran an electoral ticket to challenge those officials. They didn't win, they didn't expect to win, but they, they, they took part in that. Um, uh, around the issue of the, the brother, the strike of the brother at St. Lawrence earlier this year, which was essentially led by one of our comrades, the union officials dragged the chain on all sorts of initiatives, and our comrades galvanised delegates and rank and file members to go out and build that strike in ways far beyond what the officials uh, had envisaged or would prefer, um, but, that, but made that happen. That's a practical challenge, a political, but also a practical, a practical challenge. Just on the question of Lenin, Lenin was a great polemicizer, and we all learned from his polemics. But the Bolsheviks also led strikes in the factories. You know, the Bolsheviks didn't just consist of a group of people who wrote pamphlets. They also consisted of worker leaders, of agitators in the workplace, people who built up working class uh, support and confidence that was absolutely critical to the success of the October Revolution. And we're all familiar with the saying that there's no revolutionary practice without revolutionary theory. But there's also no revolutionary theory without revolutionary practice. If you don't engage in the struggle, then your polemics really have no purchase. You have to know uh, the arguments to make, and you actually have to know how to try and take the struggle forward. The art of politics is combining those two things together. Thank you. Uh, comrade at the front. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I do not entirely change the ALP from within and oust the warlocks or uh, remove Zionism from within. I think fundamentally this is a misguided position. Uh, the Labour Party does not seek to serve uh, the proletariat, and I think that is quite clear and we can all agree. Uh, I only think that we can get rid of warlocks for real mass struggle uh, like that of the Vietnam War, but even that sometimes is barred or it takes too long to really matter. Uh, I think fundamentally we cannot, but I would be curious in hearing your responses to this. Uh, that's all I have to say. said uh, just before, uh, they command the allegiance of the vast majority of the organized and the unionized working class. Um, that makes them, yes, their problem, yes, they are a totally pro-imperialist, pro-capitalist organization. 
Um, but that uh, the fact that they are followed by the vast majority of the unionised working class means revolutionaries have to look at how you can break the working class from that misleadership. Um, there is no, how do you mobilise the working class against imperialism if they are politically in the grip of this, what I agree with you is a, a totally reactionary, pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist leadership. Um, that's that's why that question of uh, splitting the Labor Party, splitting the base away from those leader, leaders is critical and strategic to the question of being able to mobilise the working class um, to get rid of this imperialist system. Thanks. Um, comrade here? Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <coughs>
with new industries. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have talked about an IT industry in the same, in the same way as today. So the challenge has always been to unionise new industries as they emerge. People tend to think of the waterfront, for instance, as a bastion of unionism since, you know, Methuselah was a young boy. The reality is if you go back into the early stages of the 20th century, uh, 20th century the, union, the waterfront was casualised and workers would turn up and the foreman would choose you, you and you, and favouritism and corruption and, and all the rest of it. Workers on the waterfront had to fight to unionise. Manufacturing at one point was new and ununionised. Workers had to fight to organise. Now it's the turn of hospitality workers, retail workers, workers in IT, work and, and so on and so forth. Even new organising amongst teachers was a new idea in the 1970s. Amongst public service workers, a relatively new idea. And the biggest problem in terms of organising those new industries is that the unions have not been prepared to fight. And where they fight, people join. So the, the risk of being a broken record, the dispute in the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, something like 150 people join the union as a direct response. You talk to any teacher, any nurse, basically anybody in the white collar uh, um, sectors, in particular where unionism is a bit voluntary, and they will tell you when the union takes a stand, people join the union in order to, in order to fight. Um, now, of course, it's not quite that simple, and I agree with Anthony that we shouldn't put a china wall between the political issues and the economic issues. Right now in a workplace where, for instance, there's no union, if a, a socialist or an activist raises come to the Palestine rally on Sunday and gets a couple of workmates to come along with him or her, that's a big step forward. That actually provides the nucleus of a conversation about, oh, maybe we should have a union in our workplace. Um, but I don't think political issues alone will rebuild it. There also has to be the willingness to take action around bread and butter issues. And we have to raise a political argument for the need to break the anti-union laws. Now that's a challenge, and it happens rarely, but that's part of the political intervention of unionists, uh, I think, in, into this process. Thank you. Neil, did you want to say something, or should we keep going? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think um, to rebuild the unions in this country uh, is fundamentally a question of forging a leadership that does not bow before not only the boss's anti-union laws, but uh, their arbitration of courts. Um, and is channeled into uh, looking toward uh, the Labour Party uh, as the answer. Um, simply more strikes uh, by themselves do not challenge Labourism. It comes down to the question of what sort of leadership is necessary. Um, I think solidarity can talk a lot about things like uh, rank and file politics, and I think on the uh, working class do need to be organised. They need to be organised on the shop floor, but I. A lot of that talk about revolution, about rank and file politics is a cover for a, a central question of abstaining from the struggle for the leadership of the trade unions to oust those labour right uh, traders who currently um, subordinate the interests of the working class to their imperialist rulers. Um, so again, like everything else, I think it comes down to a question of leadership and the question of, of a struggle uh, to break the working class and their labour right leadership. Thank you. Uh, before I call on Sam, can I get a list of hands? Uh, we'll go to the back here as well. Uh, yes, and then Andre and person behind you, and then down here after. We should have enough time for everyone.
So for example, we don't have the colonies as much anymore. So we have neo-colonialism and that depended on uh, these companies that left their own source out. They were almost just sort of ambiguities. Anthony, do you want to, or Neil, who wants to start on that? Imperialism, what is it and what's its relation to monopoly capitalism? Uh, I'd be happy to give it a crack. Um, I think, first off, uh, we should make sure we can distinguish between imperialism and colonialism as systems. I mean, obviously, colonialism relies heavily on, again, colonies, the express extraction um, and mass use of land um, through that system of exchange, I would say. Um, but talking about, when we're talking about modern imperialism, when we're talking about imperialism in the context of the 21st century and its relation to monopolies, I would make the argument that it is the monopolies and the hyper concentration of capital in Western states, in industrialized imperial states, that allows for such, cap for such capital um, and for such monopolies to exert a process of imperial exchange, classifying global imperialism. That is a process in which you know, the proletariat in the periphery and semi-periphery are super exploited. They're, um, their surplus value is utilized for the benefit of companies within the first world or the imperial core. Uh, and that's how primarily I would define imperialism in a modern context. It is an economic system, it is a global system of extraction, and those are the key features that really um, define modern imperialism. Of course, everything flows on from that. Like David mentioned, uh, at the very start, inter-imperialist conflict is very much a result of um, differing interests of monopolies um, and their so supposed state representatives, I suppose, um, and attempts to garner the best playing field possible for that capital. But, yeah. Anyone else like to respond to that, Ben? Um, firstly, I think there's a, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a little confusion around the language. There were clearly empires before modern imperialism. Service got 100% union debt. 
complexity there. The question is, it's important for people to join the union. You know, we, we need to go back to basics. Hopefully everybody agrees with that. Um, but there's some, some sort of, I would like to ask the question, whether people should join the union, uh, because I'm not sure whether the sponsors really agree with that. Um, so, and I, I think everybody in the Spartacus League should be a union delegate and that they should be leading in the workplace. They should be making the economic arguments. They should be making the political arguments about why, say for example, in the Australian Services Union, which our comrade was talking about, why it was important for about four or five hundred ASU comrades to sign that open letter so that for the first time they knew that each other existed. They could actually link together the two or three hundred in New South Wales uh, around the Palestinian Open Letter that met for the first time. There was a WhatsApp group in, in Victoria, a similar number, 250 I think, Australian Services Union members have now got involved in a, in a WhatsApp group. And what have they done? You could say that they've provided left cover for the officials, as some people say. Well, I think that there's a misunderstanding of what trade union bureaucracy is. Trade union bureaucracy is a brokerage function, separate class, brokering between capital and labour. They can get influence by pressure from below and pressure from above. And they've got their own particular interest in maintaining their organisation and keeping the funding going, dampening down class struggles in the meantime, but also wanting to build their union, build their organisation. They don't want to have 14% uh, union membership in some industries. They want to have 50% like they used to have because it makes it for a bigger union. The ASU members, what have they been doing? First of all, the officials said ceasefire. The officials argued and supported the idea of ceasefire. The ASU rank and file members and the orientation of solidarity has been having towards this is saying that's not good enough. And that we've got support for that because we've been working with people around the issues of what is imperialism and how do you actually win in uh, the Middle East. And what we said is that we can get the officials to, say, cut military ties with Israel, to uh, you know, stop the occupation. We got those two motions passed. ASU members got those two motions passed three days ago in, in the ASU conferences under rank and file pressure. This is a step forward. Do you think this is more of a question? No, no, it's not really. Well, please. Uh, all right, right. I'll, I'll, I'll pretend it's a question like other people have. No, don't ask questions um, to the panel. So, please uh, ask a question. All right, but, well, I've already asked a question to the, this comrade here, and I, I wanted to, to uh, say what has happened out of that is that now, as I say, Victorian Trades Hall Council are going to be calling a rally in, I think it's on December the 10th, uh, from Trades Hall to the next Palestine rally. That is a fantastic step forward. And I think that everybody should applaud that and shouldn't be talking about sellouts and, and seeing that that is the key thing to break, break the membership from the officials, but for members to understand the nature of those officials. That you can work with them on, a on times like the Reg 5 workers did, and okay, you can work against them. This so is Q and A. This is Q and A. Okay. I ask you to respect the panelists' time. This is Q and A. So we have other people oh, to ask okay. questions. Thank you. Uh, come right here. Oh, it's okay, thank you. Faces, please. Step one, phase one. We were exposed to sleep. Also, in fact, had a number of meetings for the last fifty years. So, what do you have on the The ANWSU, the Better Workers Union, when they were bashed at the award structure, that other union side, I think we have to be able to fight the trade union leadership. The same with the, what is it, the, uh, what is it called, uh, ATMO, uh, uh, not the ATMO, what's now the ATMO, the, the, the Public Transport Union, which used to consist of uh, the public transport buses and also the public transport trains. So you might look at the struggle, okay, what about when the, the, 
So you need one that's a block for three different areas, take union groups, and then later the trans union at that time, organized to go out of the city with trans. And he made sure that they were immovable. They also occupied the, uh, the various uh, uh, trans depots. He betrayed that struggle. You can look at Jeremy Corbyn. This is what the Labour Party does. When there's a lot of movement activity and a lot of mass struggle, what do the workers do? They look through their pre existing leadership. And the Labour Party becomes strong. Who betrays that but the, the trade union leadership and the Labour Party bureaucracy? That's what you yourself said when you talk about Hawke and the Accord. And the Accord. That was their. That was what they want to do. What it meant for the working class is that, 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 that they cannot have public meetings where you get up and you actually vote. Everyone sees how you vote. It's all by secret ballot run by the government. This is the responsibility of the trade union leadership. It's the responsibility of the trade union leadership that determines that AUKUS will be supported in spite of everything. Now, yeah, okay. The chief thing I wanted to get to, which is that your t-shirt, Freedom, Justice for Palestine, and you can advertise if you want to, ignores the chief question of who, the, who are these strategic allies of the Palestinian people? Who will liberate them? It's not the Arab, even the Arab working class, the Arab working class in unity with the Israeli working class, who has the strategic power to defeat the Zionist army? It's not the Palestinians. They are being led down the road to destruction by Hamas because they don't want to actually take on the Zionist ruling class and its army and its alliances with the Israeli world. It has been the Spartans that have supported Well, I'd like to question there. That he should. It's been the Spartacist League that is organised to throw the AUKUS load out of the Labour Party to expose the leadership of the current working class and its true allies. And Lenin outlined, as Neil said, Lenin outlined the political conclusions of Lenin's analysis of imperialism. And that is the social slogans that run the Labour movement and defend the Labour movement and carrying out what is necessary, which is social revolution throughout the world. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, yeah, respond, respond, respond briefly, please, David. Yeah. Yeah. Firstly, just as a matter of principle, solidarity is for unionism, and for the people joining their unions. And we're with the guy called Frederick Engels, who believes that unions are schools for working class struggles, where workers can learn basic organisation. And it's important that we participate, not just to win uh, disputes around wages and conditions, but to use the unions as an opportunity uh, to raise broader political questions. So that's a, on a matter of principle. I just assume that was a, a question from the last comrade. The idea of kicking the AUKUS supporters out of the Labour Party is frankly the most bizarre slogan I have heard out of the impotent left for many, many years. Because the people who support AUKUS support Australian capitalism and they support Australian imperialism. To expel them from the Labour Party is to ask the capitalists to expel the capitalist supporters to expel themselves. It is meaningless. If you want to oppose AUKUS, join the campaign against AUKUS. If you if you want to oppose AUKUS, move resolutions in your union. If you want to oppose AUKUS, Come to the rabbit, but kick the AUKUS supporters out of the Labour Party? It's a bit like saying, kick out the supporters of capitalism out of the, you know, uh, the uh, Business Australia organisation. It's, it's meaningless. Neil? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yes, of course, Spartacists are in the trade unions. This is, in fact, one of the reasons we were able. Uh, to approach delegates at the Labour Party conference uh, and put them on the spot about make, to make the point that you cannot fight against AUKUS when you are in, in an alliance with the very people that support it. Um, in terms of uh, coming from 
Solidarity says this, the call to drive Yorkist lovers out of the Labour Party is a ridiculous slogan. The point of this, the point of this campaign uh, is to expose those left Labourites and pacifists precisely who refuse to break with the open imperialists. What strategy does the RCO and Solidarity pursue instead? Uh, both comments here have talked about the good uh, work of the anti orcus coalition, whose politics are little, the same little Australia pacifist laborism that we fought to exp that we fought and fight to expose um, in our campaign to drive the open uh, pro-imperialists out of the union movement. So there's been a lot of talk about what work one does in the unions or the key thing is what program do you advance today? And so for instance on the question of Ukraine, I want to put it again to, the, to David from Solidarity. What they say about the maritime union's traitorous support to Australian imperialism in advocating even stronger sanctions and bans against Russia today. David, quickly. And my question, Neil, what do you say to the working class of North Korea when you glorify the party of dictatorship, <laughs> which leaves them literally living hand to mouth? If we're going to say, ask silly questions, let's ask them.
it, it, because Israel is some sort of imperial superpower, but rather because Israel embodies U.S. imperial interests in the region, in the region, in garnering a safe stronghold for the preservation of their investments, of their capital, um, and the further exploitation of the working class. Uh, that is what makes it imperialist as such. Uh, the aggression currently faced in Gaza is also a product of colonial settlements and Israel's continue, continued process or status as the quote-unquote last colony. Um, yeah, so it's, it has a twofold character to it. That's why I would classify it as imperialist. Thanks. Uh, I believe one last question for the comrade at the back there. Yes. And just I'll say, in response to this, if all the panelists will sort of give a closing comment if, if they want to, because this will be the last question. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark. And I have a question. I have a question about unifying the workers into a united front. So, as we all know, the capitalism industry is established as a division of the working man who is the industry and the sector. So, how can we? How can we, the working force, can we organize into a uniting frame to fight against the government? Is it through the union, union night of like-minded worker into a different union with a suspect suitable leadership to create a united front to tackle different aspects of worker struggle? Or through the unification of like-minded worker into different organization to create a united front and tackle different government policy that create disadvantages for the working force. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go down the line, Neil, Anthony, then Kevin, and then oh, just as closing comments as well, if you have any. Yeah, okay, all right, well, um, sorry. Uh, in terms of closing comments, uh, I think the main point that hopefully people will take away from uh, this meeting today is you understand that to fight imperialism, there's got to be a determined struggle against the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement, as well as against its pacifist swindlers. In order to build uh, an anti-imperialist and revolutionary leadership, which the struggles of the working class and oppressed around the world cry out for today. I think this is what the ICL does, and I think the Comrades of Solidarity and the RCO need, need to, to look at their organisations and ask how they measure up to that task. Anthony? <coughs> uh, to spend a little bit of time on the question, uh, how, I suppose, how you form works across different sectors and in industries into a united front, I'd be partial to a, I suppose, dual model. You want to first organise within those unions themselves, you want to make sure those unions can be organised and those sectors can be organised, but you can also simultaneously organise workers along political struggles, along political lines, outside of those union activities. Uh, in doing so, you also want to channel this mass organisation, the cre creative militancy and discipline that you can instil through heightening class consciousness, through heightening it through both political and economic struggle, into ultimately the Mass Socialist Workers Party, which I assume is the goal of most comrades here, um, the creation of such a party. and that is what ultimately poses the threat to capital and the epitome of a workers united front as such, or a proletarian united front in struggle. Um, <coughs> in terms of... Maybe I'll just pause your closing comments, but I forgot we actually have one online question oh. as well that we were going to take. So yes. do you want to ask that one first and then we'll go back to closing comments? <laughs> oh, sorry. And you as well. Let's just... We'll keep... No, you go first and then okay. you. Sorry. Um, so there's two questions that are quite similar. The first. first one is, does socialists kind of have an optimism about what imperialism represents or can be overcome with? And merging the question is, how does the left invocation of anti-imperialism today measure against anti-imperialism of the previous struggles in the 21st century, such as those opposed to the Vietnam War? Is there, a, yeah, is there an optimism of the left to oppose it? politics of imperialism. David? Uh, a massive optimism. What we see around the world today is that essentially uh, in language that was used about the Iraq War 20 odd years ago, there are two superpowers. On the one hand there's US imperialism and on the other hand there's us, the mass movement on the streets. And the millions who have taken to the streets around the world, the workers who have taken direct action in places like Belgium and the, the US and Greece and many other countries. The protests that we've seen on our doorstep, I think we can be enormously optimistic. And I think we can also be optimistic because the Palestinians have never surrendered. We're talking around them and about them. I think it's worth acknowledging the Palestinians have resisted.
and with that kind of resilience, I think we can be optimistic. The Vietnamese took on the French imperialists and beat them. Then they had to take on the American and Australian and associated imperialists, and they beat them. The, French, uh, the Algerians had to take on an absolutely vicious French imperialist occupation, and they beat them. I have every reason to believe that the Palestinians, as part of a broader revolt of the Arab working class, can, can win against Zionism and uh, deliver an enormous blow to imperialism. So yes, I am optimistic. The left is much weaker than it was in the 1970s, but I think we also are much clearer than in the 1970s. In the 1970s, the left was shot through with all sorts of Stalinoid misapprehensions, third worldism, all sorts of confusions, uh, many of which have now been dumped. I think we start on a much clearer basis. The detritus of Stalinism is by and large has been cleared away, and now it's possible to build a new left on the basis of a fight for workers' power and a fight for global revolution. And yeah, we'll use your question as the closing one then. Sorry about that. Uh, Oscar from uh, Welsh Campus. Uh, I just want to say that I think the big question being circled around today is that of revolutionary leadership. So everyone here is saying that we want it, we need it, we need to, you know, we want to build it. Uh, but I think the point needs to be posed point black is point blank is what is in practice revolutionary leadership and what does it look like in the struggle against imperialism. Um, like based on just listening to this, I think solidarity seems to say it means you know we look to the power of the working class while taking uh, you know, with modest action, reasonable action in the here and now. RCO says it means having this kind of maximalist work of work as well, um, also you know, in, engaging in these same struggles as they arise. Um, and so we're all saying we need to break from labor um, and we need to build revolutionary leadership. Uh, but in practice, what are the strategies that these two groups uh, pose? Um, and to me, it seems that it is to tail laborism because you know we're talking about you know, what would they pose instead of something uh, like what Flanders and the ICL have, have put forward? It's to, you know, praise these strikes under the right leadership uncritically, uh, to fuel more protests on, again, a labor right basis, um, and, you know, to do the same in these uh, anti orcus coalition, which, again, doesn't go beyond the, base of, the basics of laborism. Um, and so what I think that, you know, the, the ICL and what the Bolshevik Flanders is trying to do with a new line is strongest on the fact that revolutionary leadership means confronting, not avoiding, not conciliating, but confronting head on the obstacles to proletarian revolution, which is ultimately what's needed to defeat imperialism. Uh, and I think, you know, just to finish up, I do think our office campaign does that because it, it puts forward a polarization in the anti office movement um, and pushes for a fight which ultimately the labor rights are unwilling uh, to actually wage. Um, and by planning that, Polarization. This is the, you know, the fight for revolutionary leadership that's really needed uh, in terms of you know, a conceptual revolutionary leadership that means direct confrontation of the obstacles to the, libera the you know, liberation of the proletariat. Um, do, you have a, do you have a question? Yes, I'll just circle back. And, um, and I think, you know, bring this back, it does come to what I want you know, an answer from all the panelists. What is revolutionary leadership? What does it look like in practice in the struggle against imperialism? If you can maybe sum up um, what you're trying to put forward in the Thank you. That is a great question to uh, finish up. Do you want to finish your closing statement, Anthony, and then uh, respond and finish up for you? Respond, yeah. Yep. yep. Um, well, look, I mean, it's a very easy answer. Revolutionary leadership is leadership that's revolutionary. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. No, uh, in, in more specific terms, I would classify it as leadership that takes on the highest degree of class consciousness, proletarian class consciousness and strives for, obviously, revolution, agitates for revolution in all capacities, propagandizes for revolution in all capacities, and does the absolute best to fuel a militant, disciplined class line and organization within the proletariat of Australia. Uh, in the context of anti-imperialism, this, of course, means organizing around anti-imperialist struggles around Palestine, and in building a mass movement that isn't, this is partly uh, linked back to an earlier question about the optimism, uh, of, of anti-imperialism or of the decay of imperialism uh, today, I would say I have a cautious optimism and we're talk still talking about revolutionary leadership, I'll bring it back to that in just a second, because we see certain socialist groups in Australia, and I won't name names, but um, one of them runs with MOLT, um, 
uh, take on an attitude to the mass movement that has sprung up around Palestine that the RCO or I would classify frankly as flailing uh, and absent of any real strategic orientation uh, in that through an inability to strive for and see what can be built out of this mass movement beyond its spontaneity, beyond just a let's come back next week with more people, let's just keep doing this same thing, with that, an inability to think beyond that, to think about how we transition from a mass movement, a spontaneous mass movement, to a cohesive, militant, direct, organised force, political uh, and, and, and economic. That is that force would be, to me, what classifies a revolutionary leadership in Australia in the context of anti-imperial struggles. And that force is what is absent from the strategies of certain socialist groups. Um, but again, the strategies used to pursue that goal obviously differ dramatically. Uh, and I don't really have much interest in discussing any further the uh, AUKUS and ALP split debate. It's just we've rehashed it maybe a dozen times already. <coughs> David, do you want to take the last in closing, quickly? Yeah. What is revolutionary leadership in Melbourne in December 2023? It's going to work, or college, or wherever you happen to spend your time on Monday, but particularly if you go to work, and convincing workmates that they should support Palestine, dealing with their political confusions and misunderstandings, when they say, what about Hamas, what about terrorism, what about the two-state solution? It's having an answer. And that answer comes out of political discussion and education. And that's why Solidarity hold meetings open to everybody every week, because we clarify our ideas. But what revolutionary leadership is also about on Monday morning is going to work and saying to your workmates, what are we going to do for Palestine this week? Are we going to wear the fears? Are we going to wear badges? Are we going to hold up signs and take a joint photo? Are we going to join the union if we're not already in the union? Are we going to go and be there next Sunday and be part of a massive mobilisation? Are we going to come out in support of unions if and when they take direct action? That's revolutionary leadership in December 2023. And frankly, I am sick and tired of the Spartacists and people of their ilk saying that revolutionary leadership is jumping up and down and saying, we are the most revolutionary and damn the rest of you. You do nothing. You lead nothing. You organise nothing. You organise no strikes. You organise no protests. You organise no campaigns. Your ideas are arid and sterile and completely irrelevant to the struggle that takes place. If you do not take the heart in the struggle on Monday morning in your workplace, the struggle of ideas and the struggle of organising, you are not part of the revolutionary leadership. And Neil, any final comment? Yeah. Um, look, revolutionary leadership, the last thing it is, is about cheerleading the existing leaderships of the struggles of the working class and oppressed, whether it be in Palestine today or what is going on in uh, the Ukraine. Um, it means confronting, not avoiding the obstacles and charting a path forward for every struggle of the working class and oppressed in the here and now that leads toward the con one conclusion that is the necessity for workers' power. Um, not coddling and not soft peddling, uh, left labour rights and pacifists. Sorry, that's it. Sorry, uh, 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 in the fervour of the moment, I forgot about my actual closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Just very briefly, I would like to say that the panel, currently as I've seen it, has, it's been a certainly an enjoyable experience, but been characterised by an immense amount of what I would see as um, inconsiderable sectarian bickering. Um, the RCO, of course, is an organisation, and I think all organisations strive for this, but it does want to escape the sectarian trap. Um, that's why I came here today. I wanted to talk about programmatic unity and to represent the RCO's views, and ultimately to attempt to come away with stronger critique with stronger uh, perceptions of different differing uh, perspectives in relation or socialist perspectives and to build something that goes beyond this uh, roundabout sectarian continued saber rattling with each other of just 
the same criticisms rehashed over and over and over again in an endless cycle. What we need is to grow stronger and to grow beyond it as socialists, as the left in Australia. Thank you. With, with that, can we thank the panellists for appearing today? And I encourage everyone to join us next door at Howler, where we'll be continuing the conversation and the polemic will really begin. And also, please browse the literature tables. Thank you, everyone.